Amen. All right, we're going to get going here. We got Graham Davis on again today to uh, open us up with a little bit of worship. This is my my brother Graham Davis, and uh, he's had a, a heck of a week. Uh, Graham has uh, been dealing with his dad who had a stroke. Talk about an amazing way that God is using this whole coronavirus lockdown. Uh, Graham's Graham was supposed to be back in Panama, but because everything got shut down, he had to stay home. And because he had to stay back in the United States, he was able to be there with his wife, who happens to be a PA, to recognize that his dad was having a stroke and throw him in the car and him to the hospital and literally saved his life. So praise God uh, that he was, he was there, right? I'll share about that for a second, if you don't mind. Okay. Hello, do you want to open us up in prayer, Chuck? All right. Lord God, thank you so much for letting us all be here today. We thank you for the men that are here and we, the people who are watching on Facebook. Lord, we pray your blessing on them. We pray that you would just go before us and guide us and protect us and help us to make the most of this time, uh, even though we feel like everything's upended and we're locked down and I feel like maybe uh, we're, we're uh, out of money and, and just not sure how we're going to provide for our families. Lord, I pray that you would just be our rock and our fortress today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chuck. Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Well, uh, as Chuck uh, opened up, I've had a lot can happen in a week. Um, <laughs> lots of things can happen th in this life in a week. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a certified financial planner. And I said, oh, man, stock market. Is everyone freaking out? He goes, actually, nobody's really worried about their money, but our life insurance has gone sky high. I thought that was pretty good. And so, you know, you think about everyone's looking at these, these curves, these odds, these probabilities. And, and we're looking at, you know, if I do this, then I'll have the probability of life or I still may die or things still might go bad. And then Easter afternoon happened for me. Seven days ago, my dad, I looked him in the eyes and I saw drooping. He had a massive stroke on the right side. No use of his entire right side, eyes down to his feet, and he couldn't speak. My wife said, get your butt to the hospital. So we, we flew him to the hospital. It's one of those fun times you get to hit 100 plus on the highway and feel good about it. And, uh, and we get there. And by God's incredible grace, uh, we were there within the probability window of my dad getting the medicine. It's a three-hour window for him to not die. And it's this liquid Drano for your brain, literally. It's very, very dangerous. It's so dangerous that the doctor had to come and have a talk with me. Graham, there's a probability that this liquid Drano will just kill your dad, regardless of anything. There's a percent chance of, of termination, of a, of a bleed out. And I had to make that decision in that probability in that moment, you know? And so, so praise God, made the decision in faith, walked forward, and he is near 100%. He's already been transferred to a rehab facility where he's doing fantastic, and we're talking and cracking jokes, and I'm making fun of him again. So it's been an amazing, amazing week. Praise so the Lord. This, this context of probability <clears throat> makes me stop and wonder what is the probability? What are the important probabilities of my life? And the verse I want to start us off with this morning is 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, 9. For God has not destined us for wrath. He has destined us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whatever we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. And it goes on. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you are doing. That is literally what we're doing. So I'm resting my joy. I'm resting my, my, my confidence. And I can go to bed at night and I can wake up in the morning knowing that we are, we are standing on the bedrock of Jesus if we are trusting in him. We have the bedrock of him. And I'll take that probability. I'll take those odds any day that we are destined for, for glory. And so I want to sing about that with the he, we don't have to worry about holding on to him that he never lets go of us. So let's sing that just like we talked about in the past. No one's around in your room. You can sing out, make a joyful noise. I don't care how unmanly you think it is. There ain't nothing more manly than a man standing up and calling out on God's name. Amen. So uh, sing it out, bark it out, whatever it takes. And if you know the lyrics and the, the chorus is pretty easy. I'm going with these old songs so people can, uh, can sing along. It's you never let go. Thank you. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. I will fear. I will fear no evil. For my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? You never let go. Oh, no. You never let go. Through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no. You never let go. Every high and every low. Oh, no. You never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. You got it. I can see a light that is coming with a heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on the earth. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, come on. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Yes, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, till I will praise you, till I will praise you. Come on. Come on, you got it. You never let go. This ain't my show. You never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. Come on, let's sing it like we mean it. Come on, wake up, boys. Never let go. Oh, no, you never let go. Through the calling and through the storm. Every high and every low. You never let go, Lord. You never let go of me. Amen. You never let go, never let go of me. You never let go, never let go of me. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, Graham. Fantastic. Excellent. 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 Okay. Thank you, Chuck. I'm glad I didn't hear you, you singing. I had it muted just for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my voice doesn't even woken up. Whatever, man. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you, Graham. Graham and I have Very been friends long. for a long, long time. And, uh, and I can't wait till he gets back to Panama. We need to go hiking, bro. <clears throat> Big time. <clears throat> All right. So uh, first speaker we've got on today, I want to bring on uh, Jeff Teagues. Now, uh, Jeff is a uh, high-speed, low-drag, crew-serve, chrome-plated uh, <laughs> special operator, uh, lieutenant colonel uh, from uh, JSOC. And uh, I, I, I'll let you talk a little bit about the Guardian Group. Actually, I have a, a little – I'm, I'm going to play your video, if I can make this work, that sort of explains the Guardian Group to people so that uh, they can understand who's talking to them here. Uh, hang on a second, let's, let's make this happen. We are the Guardian Group, a team of ex-military and intelligence experts. Audio. Text trafficking. Our strategy has two parts, offense and defense. On offense, we fill critical gaps. Traffickers and victims are constantly on the move and operate mainly online. While law enforcement often lacks the time and resources to investigate. 
Guardian Group identifies traffickers and creates <clears throat> winnable cases to help law enforcement put them behind bars. The impact? Victims saved and traffickers in prison for the time they deserve. On defense, we shield potential hotspots by training businesses to recognize and report trafficking. We're expanding that shield across the nation. Our strategy is self-reinforcing. Defense prevents and provides tips, while offense hunts and halts existing crime. Help accelerate our efforts. Here are three ways to join the fight. Fund us. Your donation will expand offensive operations and defensive training into new cities. Connect us to donors, law enforcement, and corporations who want to take a stand against trafficking. Volunteer with us. Tell us about your skills and apply them to a worthy cause. Shield the vulnerable and strike against traffickers. Become a guardian. Join the fight at theguardiangroup.org. So Jeff Teagues is the Chief Operating Officer of the Guardian Group, and I wanted to, him to come on and tell you a little bit more about what he does uh, with, or what the Guardian Group does. And uh, I also just wanted to point out that uh, Jeff and I actually know each other from way back. We, we were in the same squad in Ranger School, and I, he probably carried my butt all the way through the probably mountain phase and, and desert phase. But uh, anyway, good to see you, Jeff. Thanks for being on with us today. Hey, Chuck, it's really an honor to be here with this group. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting to get pranked and uh, see this video released with all of our little independent unmuted voices singing alone in our room. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. So no, this, is, this is fantastic. And, you know, just re really briefly uh, about Guardian Group. Um, and then like I, I talked to you earlier today, I've got something laid on my heart to, to speak to the group about, uh, about Gideon and his 300 chosen men. But in short, um, we, as, as I was moving towards retirement, I was concerned that I would kind of get lost in the world and miss the men and women um, that I had grown to know and, and work with in this certain quality. And I also felt a responsibility as a leader in special forces that we needed to create things for these men and women to continue to follow their purpose and passion and do what it is um, God has called them to do and what they have been trained to do and do better than anybody else. And looking for a worthy adversary, um, it's easy to find in these men and women that are uh, oppressors and predators and trafficking women and children, boys and girls uh, for sex. So because I dedicated my life to working overseas, we really wanted to tackle this problem right here in the United States. Uh, the U.S. is as bad, if not worse than any other nation on the planet when it comes to purchasing sex from, from minors. So that's our focus. Um, we're not an on the ground element with law enforcement. We're more of that special forces model where we do the intelligence work, we do the research, and then we push that information to law enforcement for them to conduct the operation. You know, we'll be on the ground with them as needed, as requested, but uh, we really hunt all across the United States, uh, scouring escort ads and using using the vulnerabilities that are inherent to this market. The, uh, the product, which is a human being, has to meet the buyer, and that has to leave some sort of signature that can be exploited. So we try to put true identities to these girls that are being sold online, try to re recognize and identify who their oppressors are, get that information to law enforcement, and that's enough for them to reach probable cause, reasonable suspicion, and they're off and running. So that's really where we're different. Um, there aren't a whole lot of groups out there doing what we're doing here in the U.S. And then supporting that, like our video talked about, was, uh, was the defense, where we try to train, train the communities and help folks recognize what this looks like. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and then, uh, Chuck, I'd like to, to transition over to this other uh, little word that's been laid on my heart, unless you've got a, a question for me straight away. Go for it, man. All right. So what, what always amazes me is, is that whenever I speak, especially uh, specifically to a, a group of believers, I always try to listen for uh, a nudge into a direction, you know, and then I know I've arrived at it when everything else seems to come into place. You know, we've already talked about fear. We've, we've talked about service. So uh, the Google told me here, as I looked it up, words like do not be afraid and fear not occur approximately 365 times in the Bible. Do not be afraid, 
fear not. 365 times. That's, that's, at, that's one for every day of the year. And most commonly, it comes up when the divine is speaking to a, to a, a, a mortal, to a human, about a supernatural event. So with that lead in, uh, many of you know the story of Gideon, the judge Gideon, and this is coming from Judges uh, chapter 7. And I'm going to paraphrase some and just read, read a couple things here. So Gideon is called reluctantly, like many of, many of the Israelite early uh, leaders and warriors, to uh, gather an army and go to battle. And he ends up with tens of thousands of men that then get winnowed down. And he's at this place called Ein Herod in Israel, which you can still go to. It's a, it's a beautiful spring. Uh, it's a fascinating place. And, and it's interesting because from a military point of view, you're, you're just on the other side. There's a, there's a giant terrain feature. We, we know from ranger school, right, Chuck? You want to have one terrain feature be, between you and the objective, right? That's where your ORP is. So these guys are in the ORP, and God comes to Gideon, and he says, there's still too many. So he initially tells them, um, I want to winnow this down. And he says, everybody who's afraid, so about 30,000 men, he says, everyone who's afraid, just send them home. And that gets winnowed down to about 10,000 men. So the first requirement to be part of Gideon's 300 men was just to simply not be afraid. And, and again, those of you on this, um, on this podcast this morning, you know we still have physical fear, right? It's never that we're not afraid, but we're, we're ready to meet those fears. So it's winnowed down dramatically, and God says there's still too many. So he tells them, he says, send the men down to the river, okay? And... I will separate those who lap the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now, the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men, but all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his home. So the 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And those men prepared to meet their enemies in battle. Now, Chuck, I'm sure you're familiar with this word. Has anyone ever, ever explained to you how, why that selection process was put in there? My understanding has always been that it was specifically to force Gideon to have to rely on God to do this and not on logic or reason or military might. I, I, I believe that's correct. And a friend of mine kind of posted, posited this idea, and I've been ruminating on this for a, for a couple years now. So when these men went down to drink, okay, you, the, the men that reached down in the water and lapped up like a dog would drink, those were the ones that were selected. And it's kind of vague when it talks about it in here, but actually I've got one of these the other men, the other men that kneeled, okay, they had something. They had a shofar, and these come in all different sizes. This was the thing where you kneel down and you scoop up the water, and you're able you're able to drink the water. So the men who didn't have any equipment, the men who were not prepared, but they answered the call. So they answered the call immediately. They didn't grab any provisions, and they and they showed up for battle. Those were the ones that God selected, and I, and I think that's interesting. We don't know if this is the case, obviously. But I think it's interesting because that last verse, verse 8 of chapter 7 says, so the 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And that's what they took to war. And then when Gideon go goes and does the leader's recon, and he comes back and God tells him, I want you to surround the camp. You're going to blow the horns and you're going to smash these water containers. And that's going to strike fear into the Midianites. So I think that there's evidence there to demonstrate that in addition to what you said, the greater purpose, the very practical thing was the men that did not have the fear and the men that answered the call immediately without hesitation, didn't bother to bring their provisions, were the 300 men that God selected for this honor of defeating the Midianites. And I think that uh, for the, the, the word for the folks out here on this, and many of um, you're going to hear from a couple others, is that's the requirement, is do not have fear. Do not have a debilitating fear in times like this. Answer the little things that God asks you to, and don't think that you need to be fully prepared. He needs us in the fight, and there are times he's shown us 
um, when life and death was on the line, that he will winnow out those just to prove that point. So thanks for letting me share, Chuck. Wow, that's, that is great. And I think it goes perfectly into uh, what the, our other two guests are going to talk about uh, today, especially uh, Dave Eubank. So let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And I want to get you on the podcast sometime, too, uh, to talk more about the Guardian Group. We've had several people that have asked how they can uh, volunteer for you. How, how would you um, suggest that they contact you? So uh, guardiangroup.org is our website, and, and there's a lot of resources there. So once you go to that website, if you go to our blog, if you go to our podcast, you can learn a ton. Um, you can re reach out to me at contact at guardiangroup.org, uh, or if you, if you have a case or you have a concern that one of your loved ones or someone you know may be wrapped up in, in trafficking here in the U.S., it's pursuit at guardiangroup.org. And, and again, we are here to serve uh, our communities. So if you, if you have any concerns, just send them our way. Um, we're, we're a little bit on pause with volunteers because we're, we're so understaffed right now that our immediate needs right now is just to get a couple more hires. So we, we ask for people to, to pray for us, pray for those connections, introduce us to those men and women and families that have, have, had have created wealth. We've created experience, you know, um, other, other people in, in God's kingdom have created wealth and bringing those two together. Um, to really uh, accomplish the mission is, is where we're at, at at this point in 2020. Yeah, I've often thought, you know, we, we did a, a documentary about sex trafficking with Dave Eubank uh, several years ago and uh, oh, went over to Thailand and went into the uh, into Burma and sh saw some of the villages where these, these girls are taken from and, uh, you know, sent to brothels and that sort of thing. And I remember thinking at that time, man, wouldn't it be amazing if you could just get like Delta Force to to, you know, ap apply their talent to this problem. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. So I think that's pretty awesome. So thanks again for, for being here today and for sharing with us. All right. So we got Pastor Steve Holt on. Uh, Steve Holt is the uh, senior pastor at The Road at Chapel Hills. That's in Colorado Springs, I believe. Right, uh, Pastor Holt? Is that, is that correct? Uh, we, wait, we got to unmute you here. There we go. Is that right? That's correct. Colorado, yeah, Colorado Springs. Springs. Yeah. And uh, he's got a couple of books on manhood and marriage that you ought to check out. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your most recent book, Pastor, and then tell, give us what you, you got to share with us today. Okay. Well, really what I'm going to share has a lot to do with what turned out to be the book, Worship or Warrior, on the life of David. Um, and it kind of dovetails into what I was going to share also. And that is that you know, um, David is, is the guy in the Bible that there's more information about personally than any other person in all the Bible, even more than Jesus. And so what makes G David so unique is you see so many of the human nature, uh, highs and lows and brokenness of a man who's considered the only man in the Bible called a man after God's own heart. So I wrote the book, Worshiper Warrior, because I felt like that summed up his life. He was a worshiper and he was a warrior. And I don't have time to go into that particular thing because God's put something else on my heart for you guys this morning. But, you know, I would say this, that um, you really can't be a warrior until you first become a worshiper. And one of the biggest problems we have, I think, in evangelicalism is we have a lot of warriors, but they're not uh, war uh, worshipers first. And so... It's easy to become mean-spirited. It's easy to become legalistic. It's easy to become kind of hard toward things you disagree with when you're not in an intimate worshiping relationship with Christ. And so what you see with David is you see this warrior. We love 1 Samuel 17 where he goes out into the, the battle with Goliath, but we forget that he also wrote most of the Psalms because he was a song leader and a worship leader. Right, Graham? And, um, you know, it was his heart, it was, it, was, it was the tenderness of David's heart that gave him a passion to take on Goliath. And so that's a whole nother um, theme that we could talk about. But that's what the book's about. It's a devotional. It's a 21-day devotional. It takes you through chronologically the whole life of David from the very, very beginning 
when he's 13 years old all the way till the end and you can get it on Amazon and it's uh, and I wrote it for men so each chapter is really short so uh, <laughs> and I have I have more and more women buying it for their men and then they get into it so I've actually thought about uh, writing this again. Pastor, hopefully you wrote it slowly too because I don't read very fast. That's right absolutely but a lot of women have asked if they if I would consider redoing this for women and uh, and I may do that maybe a pink camo on the front type look um, but here's what God's put on my heart I believe this is the most important thing I believe in a man's life as a believer um, six years ago I went through a really, really difficult time in my life, a time of betrayal, a time of shame, and a time of a sense of failure. I had uh, built a church in my basement that had grown to over 3,000 people, and uh, we were one of the largest churches in Colorado Springs and really um, moving out with a lot of cool stuff. And then there became a, a issue of a betrayal and a coup, as it were, um, and I went through a deep time of kind of depression and you guys, if you've watched Forrest Gump, if you remember in the movie Forrest Gump, he, he wakes up one morning after Jenny has left him. Jenny was his love. If you remember that in the movie and she leaves him and he says, I just got up and I don't know why, but I just started running and I just started running and running. And, uh, and, that, and what happened to me was um, during this difficult time in my life, I, uh, I started walking. Mm -hmm. And I just got up one day and just started walking and walking. And every day, five, 10 miles a day for five years, I just walked and walked and I cried out to God. And I would come back. Um, we live in the woods outside Colorado Springs um, on some acreage <laughs> there. Jeff's been there. And... Um, and I would come and I'd make a fire in the fire pit. And almost every day when I'd come back, um, there'd be some guys there. And they'd be sitting out by the fire waiting on me because they knew that I'd taken a walk. And um, they just would sit there and we would talk and we'd cry together and we'd share our hearts together. And um, we came up with this term, blood, bloodstained allies. And these men saved I me, mean, really saved my life. And when you look at the life of David and you see his relationship with Jonathan during a time when Saul is after him, and then you look at what happens when he, when he has to run for his life and he goes to the cave of Abdullam in 1 Samuel 22 and 400 men gather to him. Those were bloodstained allies. And I would argue that until a man has some bloodstained allies in his life, he's not going to reach his full potential in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I believe the number one, I think the number one struggle for men is isolation. I don't believe it's porn. I don't believe it's adultery. Um, I believe it's isolation. And when you get isolated and you're not accountable and you're not able to share your heart and be vulnerable with some men, you really, really can get yourself in a, in a difficult situation. And I want to challenge all you men out there that are listening that you need bloodstained allies. And I use that term. Uh, it really means a lot to me, the term bloodstained allies. And I want to just share quickly three things that I think are needed in some men in, in, in our lives. Number one is bloodstained. And what I mean by that is that they've been bloodied by life themselves. They've been through struggles. They've been through shame. They've been through brokenness. And they're open about it. And they're vulnerable about it. And they have, and they have empathy for you because everybody goes through it. Um, before you guys all came on, Dave Eubanks was sharing. And, you know, and he mentioned that he wants to be a pure priest, but he's not. And it's true for all of us. And I think if we can realize that we're not, that's the beginning to becoming more pure in our life. And so, first of all, they're, they're guys that are bloodstained. They know they, they're broken, and they, and they recognize not necessarily you as their mentor, 
but you as their friend and they're a friend there. And then you're on the same, you're on the same level sharing your hearts with each other. Secondly, they're allies and an ally is someone who has the same commander um, and the same objective, but they also have the same enemy. And so it's not some colleague at work that you play tennis with. A bloodstained ally is someone that's a believer, that loves Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and they're going after the Lord and seeking the kingdom first in their life. And so they're, they're going to they're gonna push you and strengthen you in your walk with God because in some areas, they're stronger than you. And then in some areas, you're stronger than them. And so that bloodstained ally is going in the same direction with the same commander in chief. It's interesting that in the cave of Abdullam, David became their, uh, their commander. And in our case, Jesus is our commander. And then thirdly and lastly, I say stick to itiveness. That's a favorite word of mine. People who are stick to itive people, they don't cut and run when the going gets tough. They're gonna, they're gonna watch your back, they're gonna be there for you. And so, men, you know, I, I hopefully first bloodstained ally is Jesus. Second bloodstained ally, it hopefully is your spouse. But third, you need some men. You need at least a couple men in your life that know you, that really will walk with you, they know you, they know your crap, you know, they know, they know your brokenness, they know your, your weak areas, and they still love you, they still hang with you, and um, I'll tell you, I love this from Proverbs 18, 24, Proverbs 18, 24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So I challenge you men to, if you don't have bloodstained allies in your life, you need them. And it's the key to victory. It's the key to success. It's the key to prosperity in your life because we're all going to go through difficult struggles. And many men, most men, most Christian men have no one they can be vulnerable with about their weaknesses and their struggles. So I just bless you encourage you to have some bloodstained allies in your life. And that's great. Um, you know, I was in Syria with Dave Eubank and, uh, am I, am I on? Yeah. I was in Syria with Dave Eubank, uh, a couple times last year and last time in November. And, uh, it, it, it's, it was a really difficult mission just, uh, you know, getting shot at a lot. And, um, there was one point, I mean, Dave, uh, I'll introduce Dave here in a second, and, and this will be part of it, I guess. Um, Dave Eubanks started the Free Burma Rangers back in 1994 and started going into Burma to help the people that were being driven out of their homes by the Burmese military uh, and started ministering to them, taking medical support, doing good life clubs, things like that. And uh, I think I met Dave about 2000, oh, I forget now. I don't know, it's been, been more than 10 years, probably 13, 14 years ago, something like that, uh, when he was doing that. But he ev eventually ended up getting invited into Iraq and then into Syria. And so I've been out with him a bunch. And I tell, a lot, I tell people all the time, Dave Eubank is one of the most impressive human beings you'll ever meet on this earth. And it's not because of who he is, it's because of how he points you to God, how he points you to Jesus in everything he does. I've never met anybody who prays without ceasing like Dave Eubank does. And <clears throat> I firmly believe it's the only reason he's still alive today. <laughs> but uh, as we were in, uh, one of the rules of the, the Free Burma Rangers, you wanna be a part of the Free Burma Rangers, you, you gotta do it for love, I mean, you're, we're all volunteers and you, you can't run if the people can't run. We're not going to leave the, the people that we're, we're helping. If they get overrun, then we're going to get overrun with them. And um, there was a, a, a point where that happened in Syria or, well, it almost happened. I guess we were out looking for a guy that was wounded. We got ambushed. We got shot at. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been shot at like that. 
uh, the Turkish military and their allies there, it's almost like fighting the American military because they've got tanks, they got armored vehicles, they got drones, they got F-16s. That's different than just getting shot at with AK-47s or something by ISIS. These guys are, are deadly. And uh, so when, when we got back from that mission, I, I was really thinking about it. And I was thinking, look, looking at the picture of my wife on my phone. And I was thinking, do I really love these Syrians enough to die for them? And being honest with myself, I just had to say, I, I don't think I do. I don't think I love them enough to leave, to, to give up everything I have, to give up my family, to give up my children, to give up seeing my grandchildren. I don't think I love them enough to do that. Yeah. And I mean, I want to help them, but I don't know if I want to help them enough to die for. Them. And in having that conversation with Dave, he kind of pointed out that it isn't, we don't necessarily have to love them enough, but we have to love Jesus enough. Yeah. That Dave said, you know, do you love me? And I said, well, I mean, as I thought about it, I said, yeah, I wouldn't stay here and die for these Syrians, but I would definitely stay here and die for Dave Eubank because I've seen him put his life on the line for me and for other people over and over again for years. And he points me to Jesus and Jesus, I, I love Jesus enough to die for Jesus for sure. And, and so Jesus, all Jesus wants me to do for him is to, to love the people that he loves. Mm -hmm. And so I can stay and can help those Syrians, even though I, because my love is for Jesus and for Dave Eubank. And, and through that, that love, I can show that love to the Syrians. So Dave taught me some really good lessons of bloodstained allies uh, is, I mean, God wants to be that kind of ally for us. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we will get to know God well enough, that we'll get to know Jesus well enough is to go through the fire and get everything else stripped away so that we don't have anything else left. And, and when we, when we get rid of all the stuff in our lives and Jesus is still there, that's when we get to know him as a bloodstained ally. Right. And maybe that's what this time of coronavirus is all about for us. So with that said, I want to bring in Dave Eubank. And uh, man, what a, what a pleasure and an honor to have Dave on with us today. Uh, just, man, I, I love you, brother. And I, I appreciate you taking time to come on with us today. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chuck. And thanks, Jeff. I love the no fear thing. And I know exactly what you mean. You're afraid, but you're not really afraid. Sometimes it's so awesome, you're not even a little afraid. And those rare moments are awesome. But usually you're a little afraid. But as you said, you're a little afraid, but you're going to do it anyway. And Steve, thanks for the words about, man, we are, I, I don't know about y'all. I don't trust me as far as I can throw me. And I'm, I'm light. I'm 150 pounds, man. You can throw me a long way. But without God's help, without people's help, I, I will I will fail. I remember there was a kind of a B movie. It was called The The Edge. And at the end of the movie, the, the hero is asked, was that the biggest test you had in life? And he said, we're all tested in life, but never in the way that we want to be. And I thought, no, no, wait a minute, man, I've been tested. And then I thought, no, 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 no. Climbing mountains, being in combat, that's not a test, dude. That's a validation. You like that stuff. You're not guaranteed to win, but you're gonna do your best. But the real test of my life in the areas of weakness, and that's the test, I have failed every one of them unless God, my wife, or my friends have intervened. That's it. That's the truth. And that doesn't really, you know, kind of appear in all our books about ourselves unless God tells us to, and then you got to put it in there. But without God's help, without other people's help, I know the real test, I will fail. Mm -hmm. So I, I think about, I thought about Sadhu Sundar Singh, who was an Indian mystic and found Jesus back in the 30s, 1930s. And he said he had this dream. He was drowning in this lake and he couldn't get out and he's going to die and he couldn't swim. And all of a sudden he saw Muhammad, who gave him great advice. 
and calm down, you know, do this, try harder. And Buddha shows up and gives them, you know, be calm, we care about you. All the leaders of the major world religions were around this lake and they cared about him and they gave him good advice and he really wanted to follow it, but he could not. But only one person came into the lake and grabbed him and that was Jesus. And that's who we're following, this supernatural savior that saves us from sin, from all sorts of things. And that's the only kind of God we want to follow because all the rest are good ideas. But man, I got good ideas. You guys got good ideas, but they're not enough when you're in trouble from your sin or someone else's sin or just by being human. So a couple of things I wanted to share and Lord Jesus, help me share only what you want. And may it be a blessing and useful in your name. And Lord, while I'm praying, please forgive us of our sins. Help us start a whole new week. And thanks for this virus. In Jesus' name, amen. So first is thank God for all things. And God is, when I was praying about how do I respond about the virus? You know, we all have different circumstances. We all have different experiences. I have a friend who is a doctor in New York City. People are dying every day and she's maxed out. Awesome lady. And that's a different experience than me. I'm with the Karen people. That's the last, they're not worried about the virus really, man. They got the Burma army every day hammering them. So they're not really worried about it. But we're all in different perspectives, different situations. And I said, God, what do I say if someone asks me about the virus? And I only got two things about it. And they see two things. Well, three. One, God is bigger than the virus. Number two, we don't want anybody to die. Even though we know we're going to one day, we want, don't want people to die of this, especially our loved ones. And then number three, God has an answer for each one of us how we should respond. If we all listen to God, we're going to get different answers. There'll be a harmony in these answers. So listen to God. He's bigger than the virus. He'll tell you what you need to do, not theoretically what someone else needs to do, what you need to do. And what that ER doc in New York needs to do is different than what I got to do right now. And speaking of right now, we have our, I'm in Thailand with my parents. My dad is 90. My mom is 88. My mom has diabetes and not bad, but she's got it. And they've been missionaries here 60 years. They came down to the beach. I was supposed to be in D.C. in some meetings right now. That all got canceled. So I was right away going, okay, I'm going to go right back into Burma, man. That's what I do. I go on missions. And it's something niggled in me that, no, 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 you should go spend time with your parents. I was like, well, you know. Uh. And as I prayed with my team in Burma, they said, Dave, the fighting is never going to stop you. Go be with your mom and dad. And that was hard to do because of duty, because I love those people, and because of pride. But I, you know, prayed about it and pushed the pride away. It's still, I love those people in duty. And I said, you guys tell me. And they said, go with your parents. Come here later. So I came down to southern Thailand right on the beach. It's phenomenal. And we play football every day and go running and do whatever you want. And I'm with my, mom, my, my dad for walks every morning. Before I came down, I called him on the phone and said, you know, dad, I'm coming down. Some of our team's coming down. We, any of us could bring this virus that will kill you. And mom. Are you sure? And he says, Dave, something's going to get you. And I'm 90 years old and I'm not immortal. And if I die with, because people I love came to see me, that's a good way to die. Come on down. So we're here and we know this virus is deadly and people have died by the thousands. We also know God is bigger and we have things each of us need to do. So right now I'm here. And as I was here, I was talking with Chuck the other day, and he told me something that I said he should share. I don't know if he shared it yet, so I'm going to share it for him. He said his mother was dying, and she's passed away now, of cancer. And he went, and he just stopped everything for a month to be by her side. And he said, you know, it's hard to stop everything. And I think you guys can all relate to this. You guys are all in charge of something. And, and one is our sense of duty. And second is all our responsibility. And third is the real battle that God has called each of you and me to be in. It's not a joke. It's not just, it's, our pride is there, sure. But we got things to do, man. To stop and say, God, I give it all to you. What do you want me to do? And Chuck was told, go be with your mother. And wow, that convicted me. I thought, do I have that kind of humility? Do I have that kind of ability to obey? But what a precious thing to be with your parents, especially at those last moments. And so I just wanted to share that as an example that affected me um, to maybe God first and everybody else next and your mission and all that after that. God's going to keep it all together. 
So those are the main things I wanted to share. And don't be afraid. Don't operate out of fear or pride or comfort. And I think that's my main message for tonight. Uh, Chuck and Jeff, Steve, and the singing dude. Um, thank God you couldn't hear me. I didn't even, you said that's an, that's an old song, dude. I'm so out of it. That's a new song. But thank you for leading us bravely. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. <laughs> yeah, that is a new song. <laughs> I, I, I've heard <laughs> it once or twice. On the old guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we've got some younger people on who know that song. But uh, anyway, it was, it was great. Uh, and, uh, you know, I saw a, a movie, the last movie that my mom saw before she died. And the last movie I saw in the, uh, in the, stu in the uh, cinema was the Free Burma Rangers movie that just came out about Dave Eubank and his family. And uh, let me just put it this way, guys, if you haven't seen it, it's the best movie I've seen since Gladiator. And that's hey, saying something. So, so it, you you've got to get this movie. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on, uh, uh, well, there's a couple different sites. But uh, I think that uh, Paul actually shared it in the chat, uh, shared the link in the chat. Look, don't rent it, just buy it because you're going to want to watch it over and over again and you're going to want to show it to your friends and family. It is so powerful. It's such a good flick. Uh, definitely go, go watch that. And uh, Dave, you've got a new book coming out here shortly, don't you? Yeah. And as a graduate at Texas A&M, you know, it's I'm pretty hopeless. But it's called Do This for Love, Free Burma Rangers in the Battle of Mosul. And it'll come out July 14th in some form in the US and it's our story and it's our saying, God, thank you. This is what we saw. So we, we saw you do through us in spite of us. And there's a lot of lessons I learned in that battle of Mosul, but the, the two biggest ones, the two biggest gifts I personally got in the battle of Mosul was one to love the Iraqis. I love these people. And I didn't think about them. I made fun of them, man. When I was with the Peshmerga, on Sinjar with you, Chuck, and in Bashika front line, and in that initial attack, October 2016, to put Aisha's out, we just laughed about the Iraqis. That's pathetic. I'm a missionary. That's horrible. But that's what I did. And then I'm with them. And I remember this General Mustafa, he said, as the battle went on, we got closer. He said, Dave, I prayed to God to save my country and to save us from ISIS. And I needed help. And God sent me the two worst things, an American Christian, you. And so to love the Iraqis, which is a huge gift that I love to this, I love them to this day, generally and specifically. And the second thing I learned, which is in the book, is there's a difference between revenge and justice. And this is the difference. When you care about somebody, and if you don't, you can ask God to help you care, then when they've done wrong and they need to be punished so they will change, it's all wrapped up in love. And when it's wrapped up in love, that punishment is not revenge. It's, they, they may not accept it, but it's given in love and they have a chance to change and start anew. But when someone's hurt you and you're furious and you don't love them anymore or never did, that is not going to be justice. It's going to be revenge. And the problem with that is what you reap, what you sow. So you throw love out, it grows 10 times as much. You throw revenge and hate out, it grows and it comes back and gets you. So one of the, the most powerful experiences I had of Jesus was after one battle against ISIS, we won, we killed them. And then we thought it was over and we made friends with the family and they killed this little girl. And I became friends with that little girl. And that was it. And it wasn't the first kid I saw killed. I saw lots killed, but that snapped something inside me. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna share the love of Jesus, give food and water, we're gonna hunt down and kill every one of these guys. Not because I'm super anything, I just can't live with myself. And I prayed that night, show me the truth. The next morning, I, I put my finger on the Kindle Bible. It was, revenge belongs to me. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, three times. And I said, oh, Jesus, what I call justice was revenge. I give up revenge. And it was like a 2,000-pound weight left my shoulders, but I didn't know I was carrying it, which is the worst kind of sin. I had no idea. And I thought, wow, that is the supernatural power of Jesus. One, to forgive me. Second, to perform surgery and set me free again. So. I just wanted to say that because one is about loving people that you didn't love. That's Jesus' gift to you. Second is knowing the difference between revenge and justice, and love is the difference. So thanks, Chuck, for 
giving me an opportunity to share all that and all y'all cool guys that I met Steve. I, Jeff, have we met? No, man. No, and, not yet. We were, we were in Iraq at the same time. Um, and we're, we're, we're friends through Victor, but uh, you and I okay. have not met in person. God willing, it'll happen one of these days and, and, uh, preferably not on the battlefield, but there's always that chance. Yeah, man. Well, come and join my side. I need studs. <laughs> right now I just hide behind Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, a fat guy is good for something, I guess. Uh, so. Count me in. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, again, it's just such an honor to have you on uh, as always. And uh, thank you everybody for being here. Let's take a few questions. If anybody's got a question, you can uh, either raise your hand or type the question down in the Q and A down at the bottom or put it in the chat uh, box and we will ask it. We, we can uh, turn your mic on and let you uh, ask a question. Uh, and while we're waiting for some of the questions to come in, I just want to show you uh, maybe why Dave sort of laughed at the Iraqi army at first, uh, because if you've ever seen the Iraqis do jumping jacks, then you'd understand why Dave laughed at him. So here, here we go. Uh, this is, I don't know if we can see this here. Oh, hang on. Okay, here we go. Let's share my screen, jumping jacks. There we go. <laughs> I like this guy right here. <laughs> All right, well. Disrupt <laughs> the PT, they can't shoot you that way. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. All right, anybody got any questions? I'm Emerson, retired Navy SEAL. Whoop. I spent time at SEAL Team 3. Yeah, Hang on. SEAL teams. There we go. All right, we got it. Whoop, here's we got a message coming in. Oh, JT Short says that's hilarious. <laughs> okay. Hey, Chuck, right, while we're well, waiting for a question, uh, I, I had a comment on that. You know, the a lot of these men, a lot of these Arab men, they are, they are desiring um, leaders that are genuine and honest so much that even that ridiculous, ridiculousness that you saw with that, that PT, when, when they're confronted with, with a man that is genuine and, and their integrity is in place, they will follow that dude into battle and they will not run from a gunfight. So it, it really is incredible. And I, I think uh, you, you know this also, Dave. Um, and that's the thing that, that God allows us to do and shine is him through us, that level of integrity and genuineness. And you can take a ragtag couple of dudes like that that can barely do jumping jacks and, and you can lead them into, into battle victoriously. Um, I've seen it and done it time and time again. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see God's work, uh, through those transitions. I think you're absolutely right, Jeff. They, uh, they definitely follow the strong horse and uh and a strong leader will will motivate those guys i i mean I, we saw it happen with dave eubank a lot uh these guys that uh, actually dave's translator and driver uh now muhammad is a, a former iraqi soldier he was an iraqi soldier for 12 years and he's one of the most genuine guys you could ever hope to meet and just a sweet sweet guy uh and he, unbelievably brave. The guy's been shot like eight times. And when we were running around in that ambush, I, I told you about, I remember looking over as everybody else is like diving for cover and Muhammad's just kind of walking, just, you know, like absolutely fearless. I mean, I guess if you've been shot eight times, you're kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, he ended up being wounded later on in another engagement and um, was back uh, within uh, probably 48 hours or something, right, Dave? He was back on the front line. And we were telling him, go home, you know, go see your wife, rest a little bit. He's like, no, I can't, I can't. I got to go back to work. Unbelievably uh, brave and really incredible guys. Paul Bradley, uh, uh, Paul, I just uh, unmuted you or, or let you talk. So I think you can. 
I think you can talk now. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, hey, thanks, Chuck, for the chance to ask a question. And uh, it's nice to be with you guys all here this morning. And uh, hey, Dave, how are you, man? Good to see you, brother. Hey, Dave, I wanted to ask you a question specifically because we were just thinking about, just you know, talking about Iraq and Syria. Of course, you and I were there together several times as well. And I'm just, I'm just wondering um, how we can pray for those people here today. And thinking about the situation um, in Syria, we just, with the coronavirus, it's just kind of gotten off the, all of our radars a bit. And so I know um, you're probably still uh, really close in contact with what's happening out there. And I would just love to hear how we can all pray for the situation for the Kurds, especially in our, and then our Syriac Christian friends that are out there in those frontline areas. Um, so anything you can give us to pray for specifically would be really helpful. Yeah, from, from our perspective in Kurdistan, Golo, our Freedom Ranger coordinator there in Mohammed, the ex Iraqi soldier, we baptized him in the Tigris. Them and their families are our little team there, and they're doing an ambulance service now, working with uh, Peshmerga and Asa East, the police, mo moving patients around. And so they got a job and a purpose during this virus. But over in Syria, I just was actually talking to one of our friends there today, and I talked to Hogar. Um, I can't remember if you met him or not, Paul, but Chuck knows Hogar, the first guy that we were with, the, the SDF. Yeah, I got a network. chance to do it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, great guy. And I said, how is everything? He said, very bad. And so then I talked to Abraham also, and he said, it's, like, it's actually quiet right now in Northeast Syria, which is roughly Euphrates plus Menbij, back to the Iraqi border to the east. It's relatively quiet. ISIS sleep cells are, are engaging about once or twice a week, small scale ambushes, but the Turks haven't advanced. The Turks are doing limited artillery strikes, drone strikes, and the FSA, Free Syrian Army, is doing mortar attacks, like it was, Paul, when you were there this last time with us. Small, boom, 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 but no big pushes. But everybody's afraid of the virus because they're, they don't have any way to stand against it. I don't know, there may be one um, ventilator. i never even seen one, but maybe one in Kamishli. They had their first case today or yesterday. Um, we don't know if that's going to grow or not. But bigger than the fear of the virus, in Northeast Syria is they think the Turks are gonna invade again and push further and the next target will be Kobani. So Kobani is kind of the symbolic heart of the Kurdish resistance in Northeast Syria. It's the place the US came in and stopped, helped stop the advance of ISIS where the Kurds held firm and began to push ISIS back. It was kind of the high watermark for ISIS in Syria. And it's, it's also a place where there's two brand new churches that were started during the, during the time of ISIS. There were no believers there that we know of. And these Muslim people, Kurds, who fled ISIS into Turkey were sheltered in a church in Turkey. Two of the mullahs had dreams where Jesus visited them. They became believers. And through them, many families, I think 17 families became believers. They came back into Kobani, just across the border in Northeast Syria, and they started a church. But then just like us Americans, it became two churches. And, but they, we've had a good meeting together just recently between both churches, but they're both growing and they're very dynamic. So they're terrified. They're saying any minute when the Turks decide they want, I mean, the Kurds, excuse me, when the Turks decide they want to, they'll take Kobani. So I think that's a big concern and they cannot rely on America to defend them. And so it's kind of, kind of like living with someone who has a gun to your head and the hammer's cocked back and they've already shot five people in the room. And you're wondering, when is that going to go boom? The only way you can live with that in peace is with Jesus' help. So my, my prayer request is that Jesus starts meeting a lot of people, that, we, that he has mercy on these people, including General Muslim. I love him. He's the commander of the SDF. And I gave him a Bible. I prayed with him. And remember, Paul, when we had a hard time during the Battle of Agus, people trying to block us and all that? Yeah. And he said, you know, people wanted you out of there, but something made me keep you. I said, that was God, man. He goes, I think so. Anyways, pray for him. He's a wonderful leader and he needs help. And then pray for our government to find a way to stand with these people. Okay, we've got uh, John Schaefer is on, wanting to say hi. John, go ahead. Hey, 
both Chuck and Dave, good to see you both today. Follow you guys wherever you go around the world. Been with both of you, I think, a couple different times as well. But Dave, I just want to thank you because there's been times where my teams needed a hand and you answered the call just by picking up the phone. Made a huge difference to me and those teams. We got those guys out. Really appreciate what you're doing. But my question for you, Dave, is, you know, your experience in Burma. I'd like you to talk about how all of that cross-trained and your, how you're using that in Iraq today. Well, you know, we're all different. I think Steve, he's the pastor guy. He's probably mature a long time ago. And um, this Jeff dude, he's a real operator. I'm an idiot. And the singing guy can sing. I'm an idiot. And so I think part of it was just growing up there, man. And I asked God, why do I get wait till I'm 57? I'm running around clearing trenches and you can't move, man. I don't care. You're just not the same guy. But I know for me, you asked me how to prepare. I think God meets us where we are and uses us as we are. And it's his power through us. And for me, what I learned was to trust the people and to understand that they don't want to die either. So, for example, in, in Friend State, early on, we're infiltrating through. The Burma Army's chasing us. There's a firefight. We escape it. We're moving, moving quietly at night, you know, holding onto the rucksack in front of you, just like Ranger School. And except we got everybody against us. And then the next night we're doing the same thing. And we and I and I'm looking and I ask, look at a map. Maps are useless. You don't even follow them. Though. But anyways, I was new at this. Hey, here's a map. So Burma Army is here, and then 500 meters away is another post, and then five kilometers another one. Why are we going in between these two posts? And I never asked that question again, but I asked it the first time. And they graciously answered me, which, which is kind of a national secret. They don't need to answer me, but they did. They said, this is it. This Burma army commander is scared, terrified. He's a complete weenie. He'll never fight. We, we make a radio call in the clear, and he stays in his base. This guy is corrupt and sells us ammunition. So we make a radio call. We get the ammo. We don't fight us. He doesn't fight us. We go right to the middle. Over here, the tactically sound thing, you know, five clicks in between. That's a new commander. He wants to make a name for himself. He wants to make colonel. He will come kill you. So how would you ever know that? So to trust the people, first to trust God and to trust the people. I think that's the biggest thing I learned and respect them and how they've been doing this. Because they've been doing it a long time, long before I was born. In the case of Burma, 70 years they've been doing this. So they know their business. And the same in Iraq. So I can go to sleep at night. I'm like, okay, I trust these guys. But I think that's the biggest thing that I learned is trust the local people. First, they got to be your friends. Yeah. And you always have to beware of the guy trying to make colonel, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got Gene Korn. Uh, he, uh, Gene, I unmuted you. I mean, you, I allow you to talk. You can uh, unmute. Here, I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. I took you out on the trail with me this morning, so I didn't want to have too much wind while you all were talking. So uh, what's your question? Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah, my, my question is for you guys, you know, as, as military men, what, what in your experience uh, living that life as a Christian has, has enabled you to battle against this uh, view of masculinity we get foisted upon us by uh, especially American culture of, you know, aggression is the uh, the one and only uh, barometer for your your masculinity. Once you once you got that, you're you're good to go. And once you uh, got a handle on that, how did that aid you when you felt uh, compelled to uh, stand in the gap for uh, whether it's the people of Burma and Syria or girls that are being sex trafficked? All right, Jeff, we'll we'll point that one at you. Go for it. Whoop, he's muted. Hang on, we gotta unmute Jeff. Okay. All right, I'm good now. Gene, great great to hear from you, man. Um let, let me start with uh, when it comes to kind of the leadership of, of, of these people too. So m my experiences um working overseas with foreign armies, it was not my place to hand out Bibles. You know what I mean? It was not my place to share um my faith. In, in the in the style that that Dave has as a mission as mission work, oh, it certainly came up. There's no question about it. And it, it, you know, and we talked about God and 
and Jesus and Yeshua and Isa and the commonalities between Islam and, and Christianity. Um, they respect Isa. They respect the prophets. But again, it, it comes down to living your life um, directly. So even in the military, I sought out those positions of, uh, that were small units. You know, um, an ODA has 12 people on it. A Delta Force troop has about 18 to 20. And you, you can't hide behind something else. You have to be true to, to, true to who you are. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a, I, I, I curse like a, like an old army ranger. That's, you know, that's one of my, that's one of my vices that I, that I, I just can't seem to kick, especially when, uh, when things get exciting. But, you know, speaking about virtue and speaking about morality and, and, and not abusing alcohol and drugs and women and the way you speak about things, um, you, you end up getting thrust into that group of people, these, these blood-stained warrior brothers that Steve was talking about, and they can become, they can come from other nations. They can be Iraqis, they can be Afghanis, they can be Burmese. Um, so I think that level of accountability is, is always there. And building that team, that team around you. And now with Guardian Group is the first time that I've really actually worked with women. I mean, I, there have been women throughout my career, but, but very rarely. And, and quite honestly, Gene, I, I have seen absolutely zero difference. The women that I work with um, appreciate a certain level of, of the aggressiveness and, and confidence. You know, there's that difference between being confident and being arrogant, you know, being honest and all, the, all these kinds of things that, that we all struggle with. Um, but I think genuineness, making clear what your intent is, and that's what I've heard a lot about in this day age of coronavirus is, is helping people really understand where you're trying to go and what you're trying to be. And if you keep that, that vision and intent clear, uh, I haven't had much issue with, um, this kind of toxic masculinity stuff. Now, believe me, I see it when I go speak at acad, acad, in academia, you know, I have people come up and tell me that I've made them uncomfortable. You know, I'll touch them on the shoulder or even just kind of my presence that is, is, is um, I don't even recognize it. But I don't think that's as much reflecting on us sometimes as men. It's reflecting more on, on, on what um, some of these people fear. And we've built a fear in our culture lately of, of that aggressive male. And we talk about this word love, 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 love. And I think that's part of it. Too, where when we did a we did a study the, uh, a few years back in USASOC, which is, has a whole bunch of different special operations forces, and what makes them tick, and the answer came out to be love. We love our brothers and sisters. We love these people that we're defending. And the commander at the time, General Cleveland, he basically said, "Yeah, that that's great. Like I I got it, but that that isn't a talking point." for U.S. special operations. Like, we can't just say we love our brothers in a genuine, in a genuine way. You got to come up with something else. So I think when love leads, I, I think the aggression and the fear that people have of our masculineness um, often gets overshadowed by that. And I'll, I'll pause there for any other comments. Hey, so hey, thank what, you for the what question, would you Steve. say about that? Well, I, I wanted to kind of pick up what you just said about, with, about love. I was asked um, to do a briefing at US SOCOM and it was Admiral Olson who was SOCOM commander then. And he asked, what makes Free Rim Rangers work? And I said, number one is God. Number one, that's the only reason it works. But if you don't want to talk about God, okay, let's talk, talk about, they're talking about, can we replicate something like this, you know, in Pakistan or some Afghanistan? Don't talk about God, then it's got to be love. And if you don't want to talk about love, because that sounds too fluffy, it's got to be commitment. And if you can't talk about that, forget it. Forget it. But commitment finally is grounded in love. The only reason you're going to stand with that guy is because you love him and you believe in this. And so without that, we got no hope, man, except we're like prize fighters. Boom, 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 boom. And there's nothing in here. And the people don't change. You know, you can beat a guy to death. You can't change his heart. And so I think love is the most important thing for anybody, man or woman. And when you do something in love, man, it makes you a ton braver, right? If you're, if you, if you're afraid and you feel like you're a coward, ask God for love and you're going to become brave. You're not going to feel brave, 
but you're going to do brave things because of love. So that's, and I was just talking to a guy, he got out of the SEALs um, a couple of years ago last night. He's interested in joining us, which is going to lead me whenever Chuck lets me ask you a question, Jeff. Um, but I said, man, we need guys like you. Maybe it's my idea and it's not guys. Either. I need some studs out here, man, because I'm only one person. I'm not a little small, little old guy. I need some studs that can go. They'll run all day. Not like, oh, I'm not ready for that. No, dude, you, I need you to run literally all day by yourself and do that. We need those guys, at least in our world. We still need them. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but. You know, I think what you just said, Dave, is exactly what Second Timothy uh, 1, 7 talks about. God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. The military uses all three of those things to help train its soldiers to overcome the fear of combat. Knowledge is power. And the more training you get, the more you understand what's supposed to be happening right now, the less fear you're going to have because you know what you got to do. Number two is uh, 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 love. I mean, that, like you said, that when the bullets are flying, I don't stay in the fight because of, you know, some nebulous idea about, patriotism or you know uh, america i stay in the fight because of the guy on my left and the guy on my right and i can't imagine leaving them to face that without me that's the kind of love that that is developed by facing lots of hardship together and then the third thing is is uh self-discipline i mean the military is is known for that that they've they've developed that <clears throat> process of why do you fold your underwear into six six inch squares in basic training? Why do you cup your hands when you walk and nine to the front, six to the rear? Those things don't help you be a more lethal fighter, except they do because they're small discipline exercises that build the strength of discipline, the force of will in you to stay when everything in you wants to run. That's power and love and self-discipline. And that's what drives out fear. Okay, uh, Pastor Holt, I wanted to give you a chance to comment on that. So go for it. Well, I was never in the military, uh, so I can't comment specifically to that question, except that I would say that when I, when I speak of bloodstained allies, um, we are talking about a love relationship that's built through experience. So as you go through experiences together, as you see brokenness in your life as you experience shame and i would say that shame is the number one area that debilitates men it's not lack of aggressiveness it's not lack of leadership it's shame and shame is those things in our background those things that nobody knows about that continue to hamper us because we we, we spend our life hiding behind it oftentimes by being more masculine and so when we start to break through shame by vulnerability with some other men in our lives, um, it gives us courage. It gives us, it gives us great courage because there's, there's now nothing to hide, Chuck. There's nothing to hide anymore. It's all out there. And one of the most freeing things that happened to me six years ago when I went through this deep, dark time in my life was to just face my shame, face my fear, quit running from it, Quit acting like it's not there, but facing it and then being vulnerable and open with some other men. And man, you want to talk about a new surge of courage, a new surge of joy and power in your life is when you don't have anything to hide. You can just say, I mean, that's, that's what I'm hearing from all you guys. There's a tremendous, for you that are listening, as I am observing uh, the guys here that, that are talking, there's a tremendous amount of humility. And humility is really hard to manufacture. Humility comes through vulnerability and honesty and being who God made you to be. And when I see that happening with you guys, it really gives me great joy because there's no obstacles to a man who is walking with shame being dealt with, um, uh, that fear has been broken because they've got some blood-stained allies that they can share their heart with. And shame no longer has a grip. It no longer has a root in our life. I think oftentimes it's demonic. 
it, when, we, when we start sharing stuff, we break the power of demons over our life. It's, it's the true deliverance, the true deliverance of our lives. Face it, be honest with it, give it to God and ask him through the power of the Holy Spirit to change you and transform you from the inside out. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Paul Bradley, you had, some, uh, had a comment? Uh, no. Sorry, Chuck. Oh, okay. Uh, John Schaefer? Yeah, thanks a lot again, Chuck. I'd just like to add another comment onto that. You know, what are the characteristics that make some of the teams and some of the, <clears throat> I think some of the people that are operating at the levels that, that many of us are. And I think it starts when, when we were created. We were created with a deep down desire to eliminate people from suffering. Or uh, it, it's kind of like the cliche, when you see something, something's triggered in us that, that's an injustice that we want to run into and prevent another person from suffering. And, and, and I think that equates to what you're talking about, the love for your other man or the love for your other teammate. Because when I look back at the, my life, I remember, you know, my first real mission in the 90s was in the war in South Sudan. And I had to actually tell my mom, hey, mom, I'm probably safer right in the middle of God's will. I am in the backyard mowing, mowing the lawn. <laughs> and it was at that point <laughs> that she said, hey, <laughs> you're a man now go ahead and have fun but i think it's that 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 drive that inside that we don't want to see somebody else suffer and i don't think everybody has that i think we're created from the moment of conception to live that in part of that plan uh okay great thank you john i agree uh that that's good we need to get you on here sometime john uh, you got a pretty cool story. Uh, I have a quick question from Christopher Anderson. Let me see if I can. Uh, there we go. There you go. Uh, you you should be able to talk now. Are you on? Chris? Whoop! He's muted. There we go. I'm here. Hey guys, thank you so much for this. Um, I love it. Yeah, I work as a, a counselor on a college campus, and. Um, you know, it's, it's just amazing when I work with the guys, particularly male, male uh, students, just how, you know, they're being, they're either being turned into victims for one reason or another, or they're being told that they are, because they're, let's say, trying to maintain some sort of a, a godly idea of masculinity, that they are the problem. And it's just really disheartening. And what about, I mean, just, you know, every time Chuck does one of these breakfasts, I just see such a great collection of amazing men from our society and uh, around the world that it'd be great for you guys to have like a boot camp like all of you come together and do like a week-long intensive or a boot camp for for fathers and their sons almost like you know you bring your you bring your uh you know you bring your son or sons to to one of these camps and just you know like a hands-on you know feet on the ground type gathering where everything that we're talking about this morning could be really prac you know become very practical um with different breakout sessions and different seminars, that type of thing. So just, you know, just an idea to throw out there. I'd love to do that. If we, if we can ever travel again, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when the airport's going to open up here in Panama, uh, but maybe we do it here in Panama. That'd be a good place. Um, I, hey, Chuck, you know, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I sent right. you what I woke up to this morning. Right. Uh, or we could uh, just follow Dave and do it in Syria. And, you know, if, you're, if your son comes back, great. If not, you know, well, just have to have more kids. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, thank you very much, guys, for coming on. We're, we're done for today. Uh, Graham Davis, give, me a, uh, give us a closing prayer, would you? Whoop, he's muted. I'd love to. Let's pray, guys. <clears throat> for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. Jesus Christ died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him in love. Lord, we put that breastplate on as you say here. Thank you for dominating this conversation. The love of Christ compels us, compels us to listen, compels us to not just be shackled to our duty, but to listen to the Holy Spirit compels us to go to the places where, where other people don't want to go, compels us to, to seek out blood-stained brothers, blood-stained warriors to go through this life with. 
Lord, but we cling to you and we listen to you as our, as our guiding force. And we bless you this holy day. Lord, thank you for letting, uh, for these men to take the time to steal away from the world, steal away from whatever calamity is going on and seek your face together. We bless your holy name, Lord Jesus. Let us go live and lose our lives for the gospel today with our family and this week for our brothers and neighbors in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Next week, we've got Oliver North and Vince DeCioli uh, as two of our speakers. And um, I'm not sure what the, who the third one is yet, but we'll, we'll let you know. This should be uh, available on Facebook uh, as a Facebook Live. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the live stream now. And uh, thank you to our panelists, Dave and uh, Steve Holt and Teagues. Brother, it's good to see you again. Thank you, Chuck. You're awesome, man. You're the 21st century ranger. You know how to do this stuff. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Jeff, Steve, Dave. Thank you, Chuck. Nice to meet you guys. Right. Awesome. You too. Take care. Bless you guys. Bye.